Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our final stop on a brief tour of human consciousness as we finish off your SLK 762 Cognitive Psychology module with an exploration of the science of freedom, an attempt at understanding the processes by which we arrive at reasoning and the decisions that shape our lives and the lives of others. As, Frankl, as Viktor Frankl suggests, freedom of choice might be valuable only insofar as our choices are meaningful. As one of the arbiters of human freedom, he argues that freedom might in fact not always mean having a choice. It might have much more to do with knowing when we should have a choice or when we should want to choose. And in light of that, I'd like you to consider for a moment what freedom really means to us. We have built societies and revolutionized the way we live based on the understanding of achieving freedom, being able to make decisions about our own lives, being able to make choices based on our own reasons. But have you considered for a moment that freedom can in fact sometimes be burdensome? Consider for a moment what you would do with complete freedom. What would you do if you had the choice to spend your time entirely as you chose? How would you live? What would you do? More often than not, it's safe to say you wouldn't be doing what you're actually doing right now. Few of us would. But the question also becomes, what would it be like if you had to make choices about everything because, well, absolutely everything was in your control? Some of you may be familiar with that feeling of after having a long day, being tired from all the studying and the lectures you, well, the lectures you're not attending but watching on YouTube now, but feeling really worn out by how much you've had to think. I need to be confronted with somebody saying, what would you like to do this evening? What movie would you like to see? What do you want to eat? And the last thing that you want to do is make a choice. In fact, you're desperate for them to just choose for you so that you don't have to yourself. Now, it's important to consider that sometimes we actually don't want to make decisions. I myself was confronted with this very phenomenon last year when I first had to act as an expert for the High Court. I had long thought it would be very interesting um, to be able to have decision-making power in terms of psycholegal matters. And when I was finally confronted with an instance in which I had to make a decision about a child custody case, I all of a sudden realized that I didn't really enjoy having that level of choice and that level of responsibility. It was a decision I had to but did not want to be able to make. The truth is, more often than not, when we are left with too many decisions and too much responsibility, we are much faster to give away our freedom than we like to believe. Waiton refers to the phenomenon of choice overload, an instance in which decisions are too frequent or consequential. When things are too big or occurring too frequently, we eventually want somebody else to be able to make the choice for us. The truth is, more often than not, we are eager to sacrifice freedom for happiness. Now, as you're seeing this slide, don't be alarmed. We're not going to Netflix and chill, so to speak. I'd like to show you a clip from House MD, um, and in this in this clip, you'll start to notice that while we often like to sacrifice our decision-making power, we feel equally alarmed if it's taken away from us by somebody else. Give me a chance to recover. Give 
my money back, girl. So I'm gonna be out here sleeping on the street, not just playing. Here we go. All right, ready? This is the last time. I'm not messing with you no more. You taking all my money, girl? I ain't messing with you no more. Here we go. One more chance. This is the last chance. Go follow the queen, baby. Follow the queen. Where's she at? Where's she at? Just one time. I'll show you one time, and then she is. Boom, boom, boom. Pick a card. Now in the case just observed, the young woman was found to have experienced a rare but problematic condition known as abulia, the inability to make decisions, often due to high levels of anxiety or a transient ischemic attack which was later found to be what she experienced. Why abulia can be so frightening for us is because it takes away the one thing that we think makes us so very very unique in so many respects, our ability to choose to act on our own volition rather than on instinct or environmental circumstance. But when we talk about decision making and judgment, the truth is we speak about them as two different things, yet both are indistinguishable as cognitive processes. Both processes involve the selection of one option from many available alternatives. Decisions may have to do with how we're going to engage in action, but judgment has to do with how we choose to perceive or understand something. Both However, always involves selecting one interpretation over others. But of course, there are different ways that we come to make decisions. The most common of which, and of course, which is also the basis of the scientific method, is inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning essentially requires us to use many particular instances to develop a general principle. So we see something happen many times, and therefore we say that we can safely suggest this will be a law. For example, every time I drop a coin on the floor, I notice it falls straight down. I can therefore make the argument that should I let go of a coin, it will always fall down. I can get a general principle of many specific instances. In the case of addiction, we often find that someone who uses cocaine, for example, will use many particular instances times at which they have used cocaine and found that they felt less anxious, more confident and more focused to develop a general principle that every time they use this particular substance they will feel that way. However, even when they start noticing that it's not quite working the same way as it used to, that general principle seems to stick. As much as it's the basis for a scientific method, as well as some of our everyday experiences, one of the more common instances in which this occurs <clears throat> is when children learn to lie. When then, <coughs> pardon me, when young children learn to lie, we often find that they slowly but surely come to that understanding. On the one instance where at about two years old, they recognize that it's possible their parent doesn't have identical knowledge to them, a young child will tell a small lie and notice that their parent doesn't seem to recognize this. As a result, they will repeat that, learning that particular instances can create a general principle, a formation of the principle that my parent does not have identical knowledge to me, leading them to repeat that behavior, although it won't always be met with the same recognition or consequences. This becomes some of our problems that start to get implied in inductive reasoning we start to develop errors which can be due to heuristics or mental shortcuts. The first of which is the availability heuristic. We sometimes tend to judge instances as more likely to occur based on how pronounced or emotionally vivid those particular instances are. For example, the understanding around car accidents. If you had to consider to yourself, do you think you're more likely to die in a car accident um, involving a large truck or a small passenger vehicle. I leave you to your own judgment, but what research has shown us empirically is that most people think that they're more likely to experience a, a death by car accident with a huge truck or, or kind of a big SUV vehicle. Why? Because usually those sorts of big 
20 car pileups or trucks overturning become more vivid and more emotionally charged. Yet, statistically speaking, you're more likely to die in a car accident with small passenger-based vehicles. We allow an availability heuristic, a memory of shocking events, to make us suspect that they're more likely than they actually are because they ignore the rule of base rates. In much the same fashion that we believe we're more likely to die by a shark attack than being stung to death or poisoned by small blue bottles or other kind of marine animals. Another area that we often tend to engage in is what we call an illusory correlation, which is where we believe there's a connection between two things that actually doesn't exist. Children in divorce are a very good example of this. When, two ch when, a children, when children notice their parents are getting divorced, who do they often blame? Themselves. Due to the egocentric thinking, they believe it was because they misbehaved or did something wrong that their parents have chosen to split. They use particular instances of where perhaps they did something wrong and their parents ended up fighting to develop a general principle that their misbehavior equals conflict between mom and dad, which as you can imagine, will lead to highly problematic consequences. While induction is our basic modality of learning, one of the most common ways in which we develop understandings and make decisions or judgments in the world, it has one fundamental problem with it aside from these errors. The problem of induction, as understood by the British analytical philosopher David Hume, is that we judge all future instances based on past events uncritically. We develop a dynamic. We have one bad relationship, or maybe two, and therefore decide from these particular instances that there is a general principle that all relationships are doomed to fail. We develop certain understandings that blonde girls might be more fun than brunette girls. We develop understandings that parents are usually self-involved. We can develop any style of understanding based on particular instances to form a general principle, but when uncritically evaluated, leads us to believe that the future will always be same as the past. I cannot trust anyone. I will always be betrayed. People don't really love me. I'm not really capable. The problem with induction is that when left unexamined, unconsidered, it can start to shape decisions in a way that really allows the past to redefine the future. And as far as decision making goes, making errors about our future can be highly detrimental to us. One of the errors we often make that can lead to deviations in our decisions is the representative heuristic. This often leads us to make judgments irrationally. Consider, for example, meeting Jenny. I describe Jenny to you as a 31-year-old, fairly conservative woman who wears glasses, uh, tends to wear knit sweaters, and is, tends to be reserved and extremely polite. What profession do you think Jenny is in? Do you think she's a librarian? Do you believe she's a race car driver? Now, of course, I imagine many of you could kind of frown and immediately give an opinion in this regard, based on the fact that the traits I described would be more likely to be held by a librarian. It's also a profession that tends to be um, more commonly dominated by females. Yet, there's really no suggestion that she can't be a race car driver. Yet, we make those decisions based on representativeness, how well she fits the template or prototype of a particular profession. This is extremely important because representative heuristic, when used incorrectly, creates stereotypes or negative overgeneralizations. These ignore the law of large numbers, which is that only with a large section of a population can we actually say that they might be representative of something, not of one, one case. And it ignores those large numbers to base judgments on the wrong source, leading to prejudice. That is precisely what racism and other forms of prejudice are. It is suggesting that someone has particular psychological traits based on the level of melanin in their skin or the color of their skin. It's ridiculous to suggest that. Point is, using representativeness, while we usually think is helpful, 
can cause tremendous problems in making decisions. Another problem we often face, of course, is the my side or confirmation bias, which involves testing hypotheses in a manner that allows one to confirm them. This is extremely important because this, of course, is one of the problems we face in paranoia. In paranoia, one is not open to the idea that someone is doing something wrong against them. It's the suggestion that they know for a fact they already are before they've gained evidence. The paranoid person therefore selectively takes in evidence to prove themselves correct rather than prove themselves wrong because of course they ignore any information not suggestive of their initial hypothesis. Could you imagine what would happen if a forensic psychologist assessed the same way? If lawyers performed the same way and judges thought the same way? Well, no one would ever have a fair opportunity to do anything useful because their initial assumption would always be proved over and over again. And this is one of the first things we learn in forensics, to be wary of a confirmation bias, not to form an opinion too soon, because it might lead us to feel a psychological motivation towards proving ourselves correct. What we need to be aware of is that if you believe your partner, for example, is cheating on you, the paranoid would look for evidence that proves it, while not considering evidence that might disprove it might lead to a confirmation bias. After all, confirmation bias might in fact not lead you to find the correct information, it might lead you to incorrectly interpret information. Now, why this becomes important is that if there's this huge problem with um, the problem of induction, we have to then consider what alternative method we have. Well, Karl Popper provides just that. A method of falsification. And this suggests that reasoning requires us to always consider not only how we can be right, but how we can be wrong. Only something that can be proven wrong would be considered scientific, but also the only way to truly prove what we're thinking and really make a determination is the understanding that we can allow ourselves to be proven wrong. According to him, this will be a sounder way to improve our judgment, our reasoning, and our decision-making, and not allow us to fall prone to all of these errors. Now, given that decisions can be such a problem, we should also probably think about how we make financial decisions. Now, it may come as a surprise to some of you to know that Daniel Kahneman is actually famous and renowned as a psychologist because he was the first psychologist in history to achieve a Nobel Prize in economics based on his landmark work, Thinking Fast and Slow, which was a text on cognitive psychology. He essentially proved it using this game, which is about a million dollar question. Imagine for a moment I asked you to play something called the ultimatum game, which we often play in neuroeconomics. If I told you that I would offer you one million dollars, however, you and I would be splitting this million dollars. I would then tell you that the rules of the game are as follows. I have a million dollars and I may choose how I wish to distribute that million dollars between the two of us. I will propose a division and you will only have the choice of either accepting or refusing my offer. You will only get two chances to accept it and if you refuse on the second time neither of us gets any of the money. On the first occasion, I tell you, I will, I will give you one dollar out of the million dollars. What would you do? Now, consider it for yourself, but my, my assumption would be that most, if not all of you, would say no. I would then up my ante, and I would say, I will give you a hundred thousand dollars out of my million dollars. And bearing in mind that either you accept or you reject, and if you reject, neither of us gets anything, my assumption would be that many of you would still probably say no. If you did, you would fall in about 84% of respondents in this game, because most people would make the decision that way. But on what grounds? Well, on the grounds that it wasn't very fair. Now, was it? Now, that very understanding violates what we call expected utility theory, the old way in which you and I used to think about economics, 
This is in fact the theory that economics has been based on for the last few centuries until Kahneman gave a new theory called prospect theory, which I, I won't necessarily go into. But they argued that human beings generally reason based on logic, based on options that maximize gains and minimize losses because we're generally risk averse. Now, that sounds fairly reasonable and most of us would consider it that way. But they would suggest that choices are all about considering alternatives and weighing their importance, selecting the best option. But that's not what happened in this game. The truth is, if we were using expected utility theory, you would, you would accept any offer that I gave you because it was a better position than you were in the first place. And if you refuse it, no matter how little an amount of money I offered you, it was still more than you had in the first place, and so you would have maximized gain and minimized the loss. Refusing any offer would have actually created a loss for you. But we didn't think about it that way. We thought about fairness. We thought about justice. We thought about all these other things that played a role in our decision making. The importance is that our choices usually aren't just based on maximizing gains, minimizing losses, and pure reason, the way we like to think. And another way of considering it is the that guy incursion. Now again, given that the majority of the class is female, I'm using this example, but for the guys, you can just switch it around from that guy to that girl, depending on how you feel. Now, when we talk about that guy incursion, what are we talking about? Many of you will know that whether you have a boyfriend or not, at some point in your life there has been that guy. The guy who you knew practically nothing about. The guy who you could only help but wonder about, who fascinated you, who you found magnetic and attractive. Your Christian Grey, so to speak. Now, you had often wondered whether this would be a possibility, whether you'd spend time together, whether he'd be attracted to you. And lo and behold, imagine for a moment that one fateful night, you were at the same place at the same time, a club, a bar, whatever. And he told you that he feels the same way. Would you then consider the following? Would you perhaps cheat on your boyfriend based on the understanding that he could never ever find out and that no one else would ever know? You'd consider the alternatives. And you'd weigh their importance. You recognize your boyfriend um, is an actuarial science student, has tremendous earning potential, is highly honest and loyal, albeit perhaps somewhat boring or mundane. Um, whereas this guy, while exciting and very attractive, has no real career prospects, is not a particularly loyal or committed person, all of those wonderful things. Do people always select the best option? No. Because logic would tell us not to necessarily sacrifice a loving, loyal, committed relationship with a lot of prospects for one night with something, someone that might be very attractive and exciting, but ultimately might be highly damaging. More often than not, logic does not prevail, just like it didn't in the million dollar question. Why? Emotions heavily influence our decision making process. They change everything about the way that we think. And sometimes it's due to expected emotions. Emotions directly related to the decision. Emotions of anger when you're getting an unfair bargain in the ultimatum game. Or emotions of excitement when something good could be happening. Incidental emotions also get implicated. Emotions that aren't about the actual decision, but nonetheless influence. For example, your reaction to the ultimatum game might be quite different on a day when you failed an exam as opposed to a day when you didn't. The day you failed an exam, you might have been in somewhat more of a foul mood. You might have been feeling more desperate. It had nothing to do with the decision, but it nonetheless influenced it. And finally, framing can lead to a lot of differences. Framing refers to how a problem is presented to us. And framing a choice can lead us to be risk-taking, or risk averse. The obvious example of this is when it comes to saving lives. Some countries have different policies around organ, don organ donation. Some talk about an opt-in option where you'd actually have to sign up to become an organ donor. And others talk about an opt-out process where you'd have to sign up not to have your organs viable for donation for somebody else should they be. This becomes extremely important because if we start to look at how the choice is framed, 
One makes it inconvenient to save a life, another makes it inconvenient to not. What they found is when the opt-out option is used, more lives tend to be saved and more ten people tend to be okay. The same can be applied for risk-taking and risk aversion in so many other instances. If you frame a choice as highly attractive, likely to be beneficial and going very well, as is the case with drugs, gambling and many other things, well, you're more likely to be risk-taking. But if you focus on potential losses, all of a sudden you'll become risk-averse. How something is framed and presented to us equally shapes the way that we will make decisions.